Hello, and welcome to the CI Hackathon. My name is Philipp Hermann. I'm a research engineer at Advanced Bionics, a major manufacturer of cochlear implants, and I'm going to talk you through the nuts and bolts of the SpecRes strategy, a model of a state-of-the-art CI sound coding strategy, which we provide to you as a starting point for developing your own coding strategy and which will also serve as performance benchmark in the judging stages later on. If you haven't watched Professor Andrew Oxenham's excellent introduction to hearing and cochlear implants, I strongly recommend you do so before continuing. And even if you don't care very much about spec res, because perhaps you simply want to start implementing your very own coding strategies right from the start, you may still want to take a look at the very last few slides, at least, as a primer for how to connect your own coding strategy to the vocoder cochlear implant simulation that Dr. Jordan Bein will tell you more about in yet another video. You've heard about CIS, short for Continuous Interleaved Sampling, as a successful concept for CI sound coding that pretty much all modern strategies are derived from. In CIS, only one stimulating electrode is active at any one time. The high-res implants of advanced bionics, which have progressed through a number of generations over time, all have 16 stimulating contacts embedded in the silicon carrier. What sets our hardware and electronics apart is the fact that we also have 16 independent current sources, one for each electrode, which can stimulate the recipient at very high rates. So with our implant, we have the capability to stimulate any number of electrodes simultaneously with independently controlled amplitudes. And you can make use, in fact, of this capability, if you like, in your own coding strategy. In our commercial speech processors, we use some of this capability to achieve an effect called current steering. In current steering, we stimulate neighboring pairs of electrodes simultaneously in order to increase the number of different pitches a CI user can hear beyond the number of physical electrode contacts in the array. So next, I'll explain to you the concept of current steering, and I'll show you how, in general terms, we combine current steering with the principle of continuous interleaved sampling. Then we will take a detailed look at the signal processing steps of the SpecRest strategy specifically, step by step, so that afterwards you should be very well equipped indeed to dive into the source code yourself and find your way around easily. So let's get started. Here on this slide you can see a cartoonish depiction of a pair of electrode contacts in the implanted array on top and a group of spiral ganglion neurons at rest below, the central axons of which form the auditory nerve. In this first example here, we have a typical charge balance simulation current pulse occurring on the left electrode and no stimulation current from the right electrode. Of course, the spatial arrangement of the fibers and the charge carrying fluids and the surrounding tissue is a lot more complex than this cartoon here can capture but this is what generally happens. The current will flow through the fluids and tissue surrounding the electrode, and it will excite neural fibers in the vicinity of the electrode, more strongly for fibers close to the electrode, and less so or not at all with increasing distance away from the electrode, causing a spatial distribution of neural activity as shown, the area of highest activity centered around the fibers closest to the electrode. Now, if instead we stimulate the right electrode, you all can guess what's going to happen. We get a similar localized outbreak of neural activity, but this time, of course, centered around the fibers closest to the right electrode and gradually training off further away from it. So what's going to happen now if we stimulate both electrodes at the same time and with the same current amplitudes? Well, something like this. 
the electrical fields around the two electrodes add up. And if they are sufficiently broad, they will combine into a shape that has its centroid somewhere around the middle in between the two physical electrodes. And this in turn leads to a pattern of neural excitation with its centroid located in between the electrodes as well. And of course, we can change the amplitude ratio between the two electrodes, like in this example, where the left electrode stimulates with 75 microamps and the right one with only 25 microamps. I think you can already foresee where this is going. The combined field of the two electrodes now peaks in between the electrodes, but closer to the left high amplitude electrode than to the right one. And the pattern of neural excitation will mirror this with its centroid closer to the left electrode than to the right. We have seen that by weighted simultaneous stimulation of two electrodes, we can in principle shift around to the centroid of auditory nerve excitation between those two physical contacts. But what does that actually buy us? Well, the cool thing about current steering is that CI recipients can actually hear these different excitation patterns as having different pitches, somewhere in between the pitches of the physical electrodes themselves. Studies like this one have found that the number of pitches varies from patient to patient and between electrode pairs, with some patients being able to hear one or two additional pitches in between electrodes, others maybe eight or ten. So individual mileage does vary, but overall we can effectively increase the number of pitches perceived by the CI users using current steering. And that's what inspires the name for the baseline coding strategy model, SpecRes, for spectral resolution. So let's go forward and think about coding strategies. How can we combine current steering with the behemoth of coding strategies, high rate continuous interleaved sampling, which has proven itself to be very effective. You will remember this structure here from Professor Oxenham's introductory presentation. It is in fact showing plain vanilla CIS in its most basic form. We have a bank of bandpass filters. For each filter output, we compute the envelope, map that value in some compressive monotonic way to a stimulation current level, and we use these mapped amplitudes to modulate a biphasic pulse train. Biphasic, of course, so that the current integrates to zero because a net DC current would cause permanent damage to the tissue. And finally, we observe that the pulses are delivered staggered or interleaved in time, like so, one by one to reduce crosstalk and interaction between the channels. Here is, from a high-level point of view, how we add current steering to CIS in the SPECRA strategy. Let's look at uh, channel one first. The most fundamental change really is that a channel of our filter bank is no longer associated with a single electrode, but instead with a pair of neighboring electrodes, like here, electrodes one and two. You see that we added some um, current steering logic that determines what the ratio of the stimulation amplitudes should be for each pair of electrodes based somehow on the filter bank signal. Right now, this is just a black box, but I promise you we'll open that box later on. So now the current mapping stage puts out not just one amplitude, but a pair of amplitudes for the pair of electrodes that form our channel number one. And we then stimulate those two electrodes like so with simultaneous pulses, thereby steering the centroid of the neural response between the electrodes as we've previously, previously seen. We then apply this change analogously to all the other channels, maintaining the interleaved mode of stimulation, but interleaving channels or pairs of electrodes rather than individual electrodes, like so. So here you see the pair of amplitudes associated with channel two, and here you see one half of the pair of 
uh, amplitudes associated with channel 3. Now we have a solid understanding of the essential core ideas behind the spectra strategy and it's time to move on and take a closer look at the actual implementation. Here you see the high-level signal flow and all the major processing steps of the spectra strategy. And this structure here will be the thread that guides us through the remaining slides. You will find some resemblance to the previous diagram, but there are also some notable additions and overall this structure here very closely resembles the structure of the source code. We see that we start off with some processing steps applied to the input audio signal itself. The signal then passes through an FFT-based filter bank and from there onwards the signal is processed in multiple frequency channels. As shown previously, we have two parallel streams per channel, one for computing the envelopes and one for current steering. In the envelope stream, on top we note the addition of a noise reduction step. And in the steering stream below, we see a sequence of two steps consisting of first estimating the dominant frequency component in every channel and then computing the current steering weights for the electrodes based on that. And there is also an effect of the estimated peak frequency on the carrier, which we'll get to in time. Finally, the signals from the two streams are combined into current amplitude pairs by the mapper block and sent over through the headpiece to the implant. The implant, of course, then delivers the pulses to the tissue. A lot, but not quite all, of the functionality in this model coding strategy here is described in great detail and rigor in this very nice paper by Nogueira et al., which I'm showing here. The paper is open access, so you can download it yourselves and study it. In fact, there is a table towards the end of this presentation that gives you the exact section of the paper for every block in question along with further references and pointers to the source files where you find the implementation. So if you have any questions about implementation details, go to the table and you'll pl find plenty of further information there. The very first step in the processing chain is to simply apply a high-pass filter to the audio input, which we call preemphasis. The magnitude response of the filter is shown on the right and you can see that we have around 10 dB of attenuation at 500 Hz, 5 dB of attenuation at 1 kHz, 2 dB remaining at 2 kHz, and so on. The purpose of this filter is to reduce the potential negative impact of low frequency sounds and environmental noise on the further processing, potentially causing saturation of the AD converters or triggering dynamic compression. It generally widens the spectra of speech and other low frequency dominated sounds and helps with balancing the perceived loudness of the CI user's own voice. And finally, it also mimics the reduced sensitivity of normal hearing listeners to low frequency sounds. After pre-emphasis, we apply automatic gain control to ensure that we can represent the dynamic content of the input signal across a wide range of levels even though the electric stimulation dynamic range of CI users is much smaller. Gain control in SpecRes is applied to the broadband audio signal and there is no frequency specific dynamic compression. So it's really very much like a self-operating volume knob that keeps the signal at a moderate comfortable level. We use a dual loop gain control algorithm with a slow loop that starts compressing at levels around 55 to 60 dBA and which because of its slow dynamics does not diminish the range of short-term intensity fluctuations typical for speech. In case something unexpected and loud happens we have a fast loop that takes over in instances like that and reduces the gain immediately to protect the user from loudness discomfort. But overall this is actually quite rare. Here you can see an example of the effect of AGC on a loud speech signal starting at around 100 milliseconds. The envelope of the input signal is shown in blue and the output in orange. 
And for most part, AGC simply shifts the level down to a comfortable conversational level without distorting the shape of the envelope or the height and depth of its peaks and troughs. You can also see that AGC right after onset reacts in fast mode, indicated by the yellow time segments, and then very quickly settles into steady state operation, dominated by the slow mode, indicated in green. Up until here, our signal has been frequency shaped by preemphasis and compressed by AGC. And now we are starting to separate it into multiple frequency bands, which then form the basis of the stimulation channels of our strategy. We first compute a short-term Fourier representation of the signal, splitting it into 128 fine bands effectively. And then we recombine these FFT frequency bands into fewer, broader stimulation channels. The parameters of the FFT are as follows. The audio sample rate is 17.4 kHz. Our FFT length is 256, and so we end up with a resolution of approximately 68 Hz per bin, shown below with center frequencies ascending from left to right. Our array has 16 electrodes, so we can form 15 channels, each one associated with one neighboring electrode pair. So next we need to somehow assign the 128 FFT bins to our 15 channels. As you've heard in the introduction, there is a systematic relationship between the position along the cochlear axis and the frequency represented there in normal hearing. One quantitative characterization of this kind is the Greenwood function, named after the hearing researcher who described it. Greenwood basically found an exponential growth of the frequency f with a distance x away from the apex, the far end of the cochlea. We assume some standard insertion depth that determines the frequency of the first apical electrode. And then we can determine the frequency associated with all the other electrodes simply based on their known distance from each other. Finally, we assign the FFT bins to match the Greenwood frequency ranges between the electrodes as good as possible with our 68 Hz resolution. The exact numbers for all the channels don't matter so much here, but it's good to note that we cover a range of frequencies from around 300 to around 8000 Hz and the channels get broader and broader on a linear scale as we move from the apex on the left to the base on the right. Now that we have an assignment of FFT bins to our stimulation strategy channels, we need to compute the channel envelopes. So what are the envelopes really? If we think of our filters in the time domain, then the filter outputs are band-limited waveforms like the one displayed here. In a hand-wavy, informal way, of course, by envelope, we mean something like that smooth line here that wraps around and follows the outline of the peaks of this high-frequency oscillatory waveform. There is actually a whole range of different methods for computing a signal of this nature, each with slightly different properties. The method employed in SPECRES is based on the magnitude of the so-called analytic signal of the filter bank outputs, which is obtained using the Hilbert transform. And hence, this type of envelope is also called the Hilbert envelope. One nice property of the Hilbert envelope is that it is parameter-free and that it can be computed very efficiently at the FFT frame rate from the FFT coefficients we already have. Another nice property is that for harmonic signals, such as the voiced parts of speech, the fundamental frequency or voice pitch of the speaker is naturally represented as a modulation in the envelope. Fundamentally though, what the Hilbert envelope gives us is a short-term estimate of the sound intensity in each filter bank channel computed at the FFT frame rate. 
you've heard in the introduction video that CI users struggle much more than normal hearing listeners when trying to understand speech in background noise. So there is one last thing we do with our envelopes, and that is to apply some noise reduction algorithm to them. It's a classic one microphone noise reduction approach where we try to estimate the amount of target speech energy as well as the amount of background noise from the dynamics of the envelope. The underlying assumption is that the noise is less dynamic or more stationary than speech. This gives us an estimate of the signal to noise ratio or SNR and we then apply an SNR dependent gain to each envelope sample suppressing the channel by up to 12 dB when it's dominated by noise and leaving the envelope unchanged if the estimated SNR is high. The middle panel shows envelopes before and after noise reduction for a noisy speech signal as the audio input. And you can see how the red output envelope is attenuated relative to the blue input, except where the speech energy in any given channel actually exceeds the somewhat jittery noise floor, like here, 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 and so on. Shown in the right panel is an emulation of the effect of our noise reduction algorithm, where we apply the channel gains back to the original FFT coefficients of the first stage of our filter bank. We are done with processing the envelopes and we are now turning our focus towards current steering. The first step is to estimate the dominant or peak frequency in each channel. Afterwards, we then determine the steering weights based on the relative position of that peak within the frequency range of the channel. But let's start first by looking at frequency estimation in more detail. Perhaps you'll remember that we have an FFT frequency resolution of 68 Hz, and maybe also that the lower channels only comprise a few FFT bins. So if we pick the peak frequency at this 68 Hz resolution, we're actually making rather substantial errors compared to the channel bandwidth. So we improve our peak resolution by interpolation of the magnitude spectrum. For that, we first identify the FFT bin with the highest magnitude in each channel. Like here, bin number M in our diagram for channel 10. Next, we select the two surrounding FFT bins as well, and we fit a parabola through these three values. Finally, we determine the peak of the fitted parabola, which can be anywhere within plus minus half a bin of M, and report this as the peak frequency of the channel. From here on, it's easy. We can use the Greenwood frequency place mapping again, but this time the other way around, to figure out where in between our electrodes the peak frequency is naturally represented. In this example here, it turns out to be located halfway in between electrodes 10 and 11 and we call this value of 10.5 the peak location for channel 10. We have determined the peak location for every channel, so next up is the calculation of the actual current steering weights. For every channel i, the peak location is by design a value between i and i plus 1, so it lies somewhere between the apical and basal electrode forming that channel. We quantize, quantize the location into steps of 1 over 8, since not many CI users can actually hear more than 8 intermediate pitches between electrodes and it allows us to save a few bits of memory. As for the steering weights, we simply use the fractional position of the peak as the steering weight for the basal electrode and 1 minus that value for the apical electrode of each pair. So the weights are between 0 and 1 and add up to 1, and they specify the fractions according to which the mapped envelope of channel i will get distributed 
across the two electrodes i and i plus 1. We already discussed current steering up front. The examples you see here are basically the same, showing a smooth transition of the electrical field centroid from electrode i to i plus 1 as the basal weight progresses from 0 to 1 and vice versa for the apical weight. There is one more thing we do in SpecRes with the peak frequency estimates we already have. You've seen that current steering creates a spatial representation, or Q, of the peak frequency by shifting the centroid of auditory nerve excitation towards it. What we do in addition is to create also a matching temporal Q by modulating the stimulation amplitudes. We calculate a square wave where the period of the square wave corresponds exactly to the peak frequency for each channel. This actually is calculated at the channel stimulation rate, which is typically substantially higher than the FFT frame rate. In this example here, the period is exactly eight stimulation frames long, producing this square wave. But obviously, that period can change over time as the estimated peak frequency moves around within the channel boundaries, and the square wave would expand and contract over time accordingly. There is an upper limit to the frequencies we encode in this way, and that limit is fundamentally determined by the stimulation rate of the implant, which in turn depends on the clinical fitting parameters of the patient, so there is no absolute number here. You can see in the lower panel on the right side that the modulation depth of the square wave gradually declines from one, full modulation, to zero, or no modulation, as the peak frequency reaches half the channel stimulation rate. As a corollary, this modulation is effectively only applied to the lower frequency channels. We talked about the biphasic pulse train as the carrier signal for the electrical current in CI stimulation. What we are doing here is effectively generating a modulated carrier, hence the term carrier synthesis for this operation, which is then modulated further by the channel envelopes. Here at the bottom, you see the effect of carrier synthesis when the audio input signal is a sine wave with constant frequency and amplitude. The envelope in red will be flat in this case, and without carrier synthesis, we would get a constant amplitude stream of biphasic pulses. Once we apply the square wave, we obtain this stimulation pattern. The pulses only occur during one half period of the sine wave and are therefore aligned with some arbitrary offset to the peaks and troughs of the audio signal. Unfortunately, while this kind of temporal coding is a very interesting subject to study with real CI recipients, the vocoder CI simulation used in this hackathon is actually not very sensitive to manipulations of the temporal fine structure of the electric pulse trains. So I want you to understand what's going on in this step because you will come across it in the source code, but I would not recommend you spend a week improving and fine-tuning this particular module only to find that it actually has very little effect on the acoustic CI simulation. We are getting close to the end, and what's left to do now is to map the envelopes, which you'll remember represent sound intensity within a channel's frequency range, to a current amplitude that we'll send to the implant's current source for stimulation. This is the point where the behavior of the system really depends on the individual perception of the CI user for each and every single electrode. Due to differences in the positioning of the implanted electrodes in the cochlea, the individual anatomy and pathology of the inner ear, and the degree of neural health or degeneration, every patient and every electrode has a different minimum stimulation current that needs to be applied before the patient can hear anything. Currents below that level are simply too weak to excite any substantial population of neural fibers. 
This level is called the T level or threshold stimulation level. Similarly, the amount of electrical current that will give rise to a comfortably loud sensation in the CI user also varies individually. We call this level the M level or most comfortable level. So the purpose of the mapper here is to make sure we map the sound intensities captured in the envelopes into the range between the T level and the M level or maybe slightly above so that meaningful sounds are audible but also not too loud. There is an important link here between the mapper and AGC, adaptive gain control, at the very beginning of the processing chain. Perhaps you recall that the AGC reduces levels above its knee point level of around 55 to 60 dBA with a very high compression ratio. In the mapper, it's exactly this AGC knee point level that gets mapped to the electric M level, the patient's most comfortable stimulation level. And the range of input levels that we map into this comfortably audible range is called the input dynamic range, or IDR in short. As protection against overly loud stimulation, there is an explicit limit of 12 dB above the knee point, beyond which the mapper output gets clipped. Keep in mind though, that mapping is applied to the output of AGC. So this limit is rarely exceeded by the inputs in practice. As an outlook, in our vocoder CI simulation, we have a simple patient profile prepared for you. The T levels of all electrodes are 50 microampere and the M levels are 500 microampere. You need to make sure that your stimulation pulse amplitudes comply with these patient parameters if you want to avoid inaudible or completely saturated vocoder outputs. Right, so we have it. We've computed everything we need. We just have to combine it all in one final step. Remember, we have for every channel I an envelope, a modulated carrier, a pair of current steering weights for the apical and the basal electrode associated with the channel, and we have the electrodes themselves, the numbers of which are denoted as A and B indexed by channel I with their individual mapping parameters. What the mapper does is generate a pair of electrical current amplitudes for each channel, 30 amplitudes altogether per stimulation frame. For the apical electrode, we take the envelope of the channel and map it using its specific mapping parameters. Then we multiply that with the square wave modulated carrier and finally apply the steering weight for the apical electrode. We then repeat the same calculation for the basal electrode with its mapping parameters and its specific steering weight and we're finally done. The rest is completely up to the implant. We just ship these frames of 30 amplitudes each over to the implant again and again. It's important to be aware though that each amplitude we compute and send is applied to both consecutive phases of a charge balanced biphasic current pulse by the implant. That not only reduces the data volume between processor and the implant, but it also safeguards against charge unbalanced stimulation by some potential malfunction of the coding strategy algorithms. The implant itself has stored in its memory a temporal and spatial stimulation template pattern, which we call the pulse table. This pulse table tells the current sources in what order the received amplitude buffer gets played out, if you want, on the electrodes. In this diagram, we have time on the x-axis and electrodes on the y-axis, and each of these colored striped icons represents one current steered channel being delivered with a pair of simultaneous biphasic pulses. You can see that we avoid stimulating neighboring channels right after one another in order to reduce channel interaction, as in CIS. So the implant electronics receives the 30 amplitudes 
for the next frame. It generates biphasic pulses on all the 16 electrodes according to the pulse table and the outcome is this. This is a typical reading you'd get from an oscilloscope when the implant is processing speech. At the macro scale, you can see the pulse amplitudes of the 16 electrodes varying in time, reflecting roughly the speech envelope in the different frequency bands. Looking more closely at the pattern, you can still make out the trademarks of current steering, the time staggered occurrence of simultaneous pulses on neighboring electrodes. Kudos to all of you who stayed with me throughout all these previous slides. I uh, hope you got a decent idea of what it is we're trying to achieve with SpecRes and that you have the general structure of the strategy in mind when you go and work yourselves into the source code. Here I've compiled a table of references for all the steps we discussed, pointing you to the relevant section of the paper by Nogueira et al, which I already flashed briefly towards the beginning, and also pointing out the source code where you can find this functionality implemented. At the very end, I want to give you a brief outlook of what's next. This diagram here has been haunting us over many, many slides now, but it describes the signal flow in our actual system comprising speech processor and implant. Whereas you, of course, won't have an implant at hand to experiment with, let alone to listen to. So instead, we provide you with a simulator of the implant current generation mechanism, which transforms the amplitude buffers of 30 elements for each frame into simulated oscilloscope readings of the 16 electrode outputs. And then you'll need to listen somehow to the electrodes in a way that resembles what an actual CI user would perceive in that situation. That's where the vocoder comes in as the final link in the chain. The vocoder emulates the electric excitation of the auditory nerve and turns that back into an audio signal you can listen to. Jordan Beim will tell you all about this in his presentation. But here are a few fundamental constraints I would like to point out that you have to stick to when using the vocoder, whether you reuse all or certain parts of SpecRes or whether you start from scratch with your very own coding strategy. The first constraint is related fundamentally to stimulation safety. Your stimulation has to be charge balanced, meaning that for every electrode, your stimulation currents have to integrate to zero over time. Otherwise, the electrochemical processes at the real electrodes would over time cause irreversible toxic damage to the tissue. And the vocoder will simply not accept non-charge balanced inputs. The second constraint is less critical, but you'll likely be cursing at the vocoder if you're not aware of the reasonable current range that it supports. If you use our implant simulator, it's relevant for the amplitudes that go into it. But in any case, it certainly applies to the signal that goes into the vocoder itself. Our simulated patient has a threshold of 500 microamperes for every electrode, meaning that continued stimulation with pulses of lower amplitude will simply not cause any neural excitation and all you get is silence. We also discussed that the most comfortable level of our simulated patient is 500 microampere. This is a good stimulation level to shoot for when you think about current mapping and dynamic compression. Above 500 microampere, the vocoder output will get more and more compressed and at around 600 microampere, the simulated neurons close to the stimulating electrode will go into absolute saturation, meaning that higher currents will simply not cause any further increase in excitation. And finally, the implant simulator returns the 16 electrode currents with a sample rate 
of 55,556 hertz, corresponding to a single phase of one pulse lasting 18 microseconds. And lastly, the software constraint really concerns the scaling of the audio signals that go into the coding strategy. We'll provide you with samples of speech, noises, and music, and for all of them, the same scaling applies. A digital amplitude of plus or minus one corresponds to an instantaneous sound pressure level of 111.6 decibels SPL. The scaling is implicitly assumed by our implementation of AGC and the mapper. So if you want to use those, be careful if you decide to change the signal scaling. You can expect the signals we provide to be in a range of around 50 to 70 dB or so over their entire duration. But of course, the instantaneous level will vary over a much larger range than that. So that's my final advice to you. For all further details regarding the vocoder and all practical aspects of how to download and start using and working with the source code, please check out Jordan's presentation. All that's left for me to do now is to thank you for participating. I'm really excited to see what improvements and new ideas you'll come up with. So best of luck with all your efforts and enjoy.